everybody, it's Eddie Trunk, and welcome to this special edition of Trunk Nation on Faction Talk, Sirius XM, Channel 103, and of course, the Sirius XM app. Our latest producer spotlight is a guy that I've been trying to wrangle to do this for a very long time, and I'm so excited that we finally do have him. He is a guy that's been behind so many of the guitar players and records that we've certainly loved over the decades, initially through his label Shrapnel Records. Joining me now is Mike Varney. There's a band called Le Mans that when I told my audience that I was going to be having you on to do this, somebody called in and said they wanted me to ask you about this group because I'm not familiar with them, but they said the first record was real heavy, the second record was way more commercial, but also very good, and that I guess some people from this band spun off into other groups. What what was the story with that band? Well, Le Mans was a great band, and uh, Peter Marino was a great, is a great rock singer and songwriter, and uh, he was about 23 or so, I think, at the time. I, I'm not sure. And we brought Derek Frigo. Uh, he and Josh Ramos came out from Chicago. They had Le Mans in Chicago, and Pete became the singer. And then his thing is, and they brought Kenny Stavropoulos out, too. And uh, Kenny and Peter both ended up in Cacophony. Uh, but anyway, uh, Le Mans did an album for me. Uh, the demos were shopped around uh, later, and uh, Columbia Records decided they wanted uh, Le Mans. We made a really good record, and it has a lot of cool songs on it. Derek Frigo is just playing really well on it. Pete's singing great on it. It's Everybody's playing great. It's a really cool record. But it was supposed to be released the week that uh, everybody got busted for payola. And it was one of those big, you know, in, in the history of the record industry, it was one of those you know few times where there was a big, huge uproar. And so, uh, as I was told, uh, a lot of the independent promotion guys and whatnot that they would put on records like this, they were all kind of terminated and everything was brought in house and they had bigger records that they had to attend to in house. So a brand new band like that, they didn't have as much of an investment as the, in them as they had in a lot of this other stuff, nor was the payback as sure as some of the bigger artists. So the promotional attention went to the, uh, you know, the big artists that they are that they already had or people that they had a, a greater investment in. And this is what I was told, I, you know, I, I can't say for sure, but that, that that's what I was told. So basically that record uh, didn't really get much uh, push at all. And uh, shortly uh, thereafter, that, that, that record came out, I guess, in 86. So I guess it was probably maybe, I'm not good on all the years here, but I guess it was probably around 88-ish when... Uh, Pete Marino uh, came into Cacophony, but he was brought in initially as more like a session singer. And uh, his singing in Cacophony is nothing like the singing on uh, that, that Le Mans album on Columbia. I think that Le Mans album on Columbia is, is quite a AOR uh, for AOR people. I think it, I think it's one of the one of the records that a lot of people talk about mm. because it, it really with, with any with any justice, uh, Pete and those guys would have had a a, a, a big record. But, you know, unfortunately, that's, that's the record industry. Yeah, no, clearly the story of the record industry. You mentioned Cacophony a couple times, which is known, you know, which is Jason Becker and uh, Marty Friedman. Was it your idea to put the two of them together in that? Yes. Uh, Jason was about 16 when I heard him. And Marty and I had been working together and talking about a solo project for quite a while. Marty moved out to San Francisco. Um, Marty uh, and I were talking about, you know, his next record and what we were going to do, and I was really excited about it. And then Jason Becker comes along, and I said to Marty, you know, this this guy's young, but he's got something, and I think if the two of you guys work together, uh, I think the way he's developing from demo to demo, he's just moving fast. You know, he's he's going to be somebody to really you know reckon with. And so I think Marty, maybe he'd have to tell the story, you know, his, from his perspective. But I think he kind of maybe went over there sort of like, okay, Mike wants me to meet this guy. <laughs> Marty's a guy that always has a lot of vision. So he's not usually looking for somebody for ideas. He's got a lot of ideas, you know, and he's good that way. So, but he, he took a leap of faith and went over to meet Jason and just probably lived about 20 miles away from each other. 
And he went over there, and I was all excited. And I talked to him, and I said, oh, how did it work out? He said, man, I, I, think, I think this guy and I could do something. And so those guys just kind of fed off each other, and just both of them got, you know, better and better, you know, just over a six-month period. And so when that Cacophony record came out, uh, we get to record that. Jason was 17 years old. Wow. And uh, and maybe even that old when he did Perpetual Burn. So his parents had to come in and uh, go through, there was a legal process or whatever that we were going through because he was a, a minor. And uh, his parents uh, and I and did all the right, we did all the right stuff so that, uh, you know, that could be legitimately released and wouldn't have to worry about anything in the future. And, um, as you know, sometimes people make contracts when they're kids. They go, oh, it was only a kid. What did he know? But right. You know, it was, it was, they had a lawyer and was done through the, I think we did it all the, the right way, at least as I knew it back then. What did I know? I was still, still pretty young. But um, anyway, yeah, so we just put this band together and we put these guys together that were, we thought were really cool. And it was a, you know, that's the thing, like a, to get a lot of the great records that I, I mean, great in my mind, um, anyway, uh, you know, these weren't four guys always sitting, uh, you know, they grew up in high school together. You know, a lot of times you're bringing a guy in from, you know, New York, one's from Pennsylvania and somebody from somewhere else, you know? And so unfortunately the reason why a lot of the shrapnel artists didn't get bigger is that, you know, most of them didn't tour at all. And the ones that did maybe went out once or twice, <laughs> you know, so there, with a few exceptions, but there wasn't, there were, they weren't, a lot of these things weren't like Chastain, for instance, I knew Leather because Pete Marino introduced me to her, and I thought she was a great singer. And so Chastain was looking to do something, and I put them together and brought Fred Corey out, who was an unknown drummer, you know, way before Cinderella. I brought him out to play drums, and then later the next one, Ken Mary. Both those guys have had good careers in the music business. But, you know, I was just looking for exceptional people and wanted to record the very best. And so I missed out on the guys that went to, you know, went to high school together and, and whatnot, you know, because I, I was always looking for better, you know, better players. I want to record better things. So it wasn't such a great strategy when it comes to building bands. A lot of the S2 bands made great records, but personalities weren't always, you know, made for each other. Of all these records that you released on Shrapnel with all these people, especially early on, uh, I don't have them all in front of me and I don't know, but did you personally produce all of them or did other producers come in and work as the label progressed or was part of the deal that you wanted to go in the studio and see the record through? You know, um, that's a good question. Like if you take something like Racer X, um, Racer X, uh, Paul Gilbert came to me at age 15 and looking to play with Ozzy. And, uh, I love telling this story because, uh, he, he sounded, uh, the record, the tape he sent me sounded great, right? And so uh, he said, can you get me a hookup? And I, I said, well, I've talked to Sharon a couple times. Maybe uh, I you want to get a hold of her. I said, but so tell me about yourself. Are you are you fat? No, 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 no. Are you bearded? <laughs> that wasn't cool. You know, no. Uh, short hair, bald? No, no. Uh, asked him all these questions that I said, you know, are you old, too old? No, no. How old are you? Oh, 15. <laughs> so, wow. I said, that's, I can't believe it, man. You're great. I said, well, let's, let's just keep in touch here. And, and then let's, let's look at doing something, you know, down the road together. So from that moment on, Paul just kept sending me demos and whatnot. And, uh, so racer X was another one of those kind of things, uh, but that was a little more organic because John had lived in the town in Nevada, in Nevada where I, I had lived. And, uh, he had played in a band with this kid that was one of the shredders I brought down the guitar player magazine for that, that party that I mentioned earlier, Dan Meblin. Uh, so I knew about John from living in my town, but he was down at the bass Institute and he met Paul Gilbert and then they had a drummer they liked to play with. So they were all ready to go finally, but needed a singer. So first guy I recommended was Mark Slaughter. And then, uh, Mark Slaughter, um, he, uh, he made a great demo, but, they said, well, who else you got? And he said, well, I got this guy, Jeff Martin. And so Jeff Martin uh, recorded with him. And I think maybe because of the, the heaviness of it, the Judas Priest, you know, <laughs> I don't know what. Jeff's an awesome singer and just an awesome guy. So the chemistry was, was better for them. So uh, they decided to go uh, that direction. And uh, so 
I, I think to answer your question, because this is one of those bands, I don't think I produced them. I think that I helped go through material, you know, and maybe went through some arrangements and got things, you know, maybe to the point where, you know, I think everybody was, was, was fairly happy. And then I think, I'd have to go look at credits, but I think maybe Steve Fontano ended up producing those. This is with Racer X you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. And I'm, and I'm curious. I'm curious, Mike. Did you did Paul Gilbert ever audition for Ozzy? Oh no, no. Because you said he came um, to you wanting that, but it, did you become yeah. like I know you became and still are to some degree like the guitar whisperer, the guy that people goes to to consult on guitar players or to find somebody. And I know that became a really big thing for you. Did, were, did Sharon and did Ozzy come to you when they needed guitar players? Were you, did no, you become no, that I, kind of sounding board guy? I think I talked to them regarding drummers once and recommended some, some people. Um, I might have been even been the one that recommended Fred Corey because Fred was in the band for a little while. Um, but um, no, I, and the worst thing here is I don't want to take credit for anything I, I haven't done, you know, and, and I, I would tend to opt to not take credit for something, uh, hopefully, you know, rather than take credit. But it, some of this stuff's been so long ago, there were 550 records between all the labels. And so it, it gets a little bit confusing who does what. Um, sure. But no, no, I, I did not uh, recommend any guitar players for Ozzy. They never came to me uh, looking for anybody. Um, no. When you um, saw, you mentioned Derek Frigo earlier, who sadly passed away, but Derek, you, you had at a very early age, uh, Paul Gilbert at 15, Jason Becker at 15 or 16, uh, Marty Friedman, of course, super young. All of these guitar players went on to do other big things. Of course, Marty goes to Megadeth, Derek Frigo, Enough's Enough, Jason Becker, David Lee Roth. I mean, all of this stuff, Ingve goes on to this major career as a solo artist after Alcatraz. I would imagine for you, that has, being at your core like me and so many others, just a music fan, that has to feel very rewarding for you to have been, on, been in on the ground floor of people's careers like that. I would imagine so, right? Well, I, I, I guess if I ever think about it, but honestly, I'm more of an obsessed fan than, than I was when I was a kid. I'm buying records and listening to stuff, and, and uh, I just feel lucky that I had a career where, where I could do that. But no, I, I don't really reflect on this too much. Uh, it's just, you can relate to this. It's just the life you led, right? You got to do what you wanted to do, and uh, you're just doing your thing. And so, yeah, I, I'm i happy that it worked out that way. But I guess to really appreciate it, I guess people would have to see all of the guitar players I didn't work with. <laughs> <laughs> because we're talking about tens of thousands probably. I don't even know how maybe that's extreme, but I mean like postal bins filled up, you know, taking you know, multiple ones at home sometimes, you know, from a visit, like stuff was coming from all over the place. But like uh, Jason Becker, that is a guitar player that I did hook up with David Lee Roth and uh, I did recommend him and he did get that gig. So yeah, there were situations where I did do that quite a bit, but then there were, a lot of things that, no, of course not, didn't have anything to do with. But I did, that's one of the things I did do out of the guys you mentioned. But I do want to say something. I had an engineer by the name of Steve Fontano, and he and I did the Wasp album uh, when uh, I got hired to do that with Blackie, and I went down there with Steve. And Steve was the guy I went to junior high school and high school with, and he had gone to work at the record plant while I was off playing in all those bands just post-high school. And um, he just had a really great talent and all, a lot of these artists today when they think back on shrapnel whether i produced something or whether he did people just love that guy and, and i do and I, I think he's done maybe 120 records or something for me a whole bunch he went on to get a couple grammys he worked on santana's supernatural record and worked with a bunch of other other large people over time but he had paid his dues on the record plant family uh before starting to work from shrapnel for all those years but yeah i had a guy they could, they could produce stuff. They could sit there and go, no, that's a bad chorus. You know, hey, that's a better verse. You know, he, he was he was very talented as a songwriter and, and a producer and whatnot. He grew, he and I both kind of grew together, you know, because we've known each other so many years. And uh, anyway, 
Well, here's what I want to do, Mike. I want to I want to take a quick break here, but you touched on an area of your career that I do want to talk about because you mentioned Wasp and another record around that time that you produced that I absolutely love. I want to get some something from you on that and other guitar players we need to talk about. And the other thing I'll tell the audience right now is uh, Mike had has multiple record labels that have come out specializing in other genres of music for the purposes of this conversation will stay predominantly on the rock and metal stuff because that's what my audience is most in tune with. But, uh, you know, going through your discography and all the other offshoots of stuff, whether it's blues or jazz or what have you that you did uh, and continue to do is is amazing. So I do want to acknowledge that. But I want to get a quick break here and then we'll come back and we'll continue talking about your career, your stories and all these amazing guitar players. It's Eddie Trunk, special producer spotlight edition of Trunk Nation here on Faction Talk 103. Uh, we're joined this time around by Mike Varney. More with Mike coming up right after this. <laughs> 